D'abord, on va commencer avec euh, François Gemen, qui est enseignant euh, à Sciences Po et directeur de l'Institut Hugo euh, à l'Université de Liège. Euh, donc un premier profil euh, très européen déjà et il euh, travaille beaucoup sur les questions euh, des migrations environnementales et des conséquences du changement climatique et... Sur ces questions, il a également contribué à la rédaction du sixième rapport du GIEC. Et je pense que vous avez beaucoup de choses à nous raconter. Ça va nous fournir beaucoup de billes pour la table ronde qui va suivre après. Merci beaucoup, François Gamen. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à, à, à toutes et à tous. Je ne serai pas euh, très long, mais je voulais simplement vous dire quelques mots euh, en ouverture de cette session. D'abord pour vous remercier d'être là, pour vous remercier aussi de toutes les solutions que vous mettez en œuvre au quotidien. Et je crois qu'il est essentiel aujourd'hui, dans le moment que nous vivons, de montrer, de faire la démonstration que ces solutions existent et qu'elles peuvent être mises en œuvre à plus grande échelle. Et c'est pour ça que des salons comme celui-ci sont tellement importants, parce qu'ils permettent de faire la démonstration concrète de l'existence de ces solutions. Or, aujourd'hui, il y a dans le débat public une sorte de petite musique qu'on commence à entendre et qui se fait de plus en plus lancinante, selon laquelle la transition n'aurait pas lieu, selon laquelle cela serait impossible, serait trop gourmand en énergie, comme quand on n'y arriverait pas, il serait déjà trop tard, etc. Cette musique sur l'impossibilité de la transition, elle produit des effets absolument catastrophiques dans l'opinion. On a aujourd'hui un Français ou une Française sur 6, 16% de la population, qui sont convaincus qu'on n'y arrivera pas, qu'il est déjà trop tard, qu'il n'y a rien à faire. Et je veux être très clair, ce climato-défaitisme produit exactement le même effet que le populisme ou le climato-scepticisme, et cet effet, c'est celui de l'immobilité. C'est celui de ne rien faire, soit parce qu'on pense qu'il ne faut rien faire, soit parce qu'on pense que c'est trop tard et qu'il n'y a plus rien à faire. C'est pour ça qu'il est absolument essentiel de faire la démonstration que nous pouvons y arriver et que nous allons y arriver. Et... Il y a évidemment la question du savoir-faire qui est essentielle, il y a aussi la question du faire savoir. Et je crois beaucoup que si nous voulons réussir cette transition, il va falloir nous inspirer les uns des autres. Il va falloir montrer concrètement pourquoi un mix énergétique décarboné est possible et pourquoi ça nous permet d'avoir une meilleure énergie, plus efficace et moins cher. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, trop souvent, je crois que les objectifs de décarbonation apparaissent de façon un peu floue aux gens, que ce sont de grands agrégats, des chiffres à horizon lointain de neutralité carbone pour 2050, de plus de degrés ou plus 1 degré et demi pour 2100, mais que concrètement, beaucoup de gens ont du mal à envisager ce que concrètement cela veut dire et à quoi concrètement pourrait ressembler un monde décarboné. Et c'est pour cela qu'il est important de leur montrer à quoi cela pourrait ressembler, de rendre tangible la transition. Parce que si nous ne rendons pas tangible la transition, à ce moment-là, nous allons sans cesse l'apercevoir comme une contrainte. Et aujourd'hui, quand on discute de transition énergétique, quand on discute de lutte contre le changement climatique, ça apparaît souvent aux yeux de beaucoup de gens comme une contrainte à laquelle nous devrions nous plier, comme une longue liste d'efforts à fournir, de coûts supplémentaires à supporter, euh, de sacrifices auxquels consentir, de renoncements à accepter, c'est-à-dire une liste de choses que beaucoup de gens, moi le premier, n'ont pas envie de faire. Et je crois que si la question de la transition apparaît aujourd'hui comme une contrainte, entraînant dans son sillage des phénomènes de populisme et de ressac, et de ressac politique, c'est parce que nous avons une vision assez claire du monde dans lequel nous ne voudrions pas vivre, c'est celui qui est décrit dans les rapports du GIEC, dans les travaux scientifiques, c'est un monde 
ravagé par les impacts du changement climatique, un monde où la biodiversité aurait disparu ou quasiment complètement disparu. Et de ce fait, nous savons le chemin que nous ne voulons pas prendre. Nous savons là où nous ne voulons pas aller. Mais par contre, on a beaucoup de mal à définir ensemble le chemin que nous voudrions emprunter. On a beaucoup de mal à se rendre compte concrètement de ce à quoi pourrait ressembler un monde dans lequel nous voudrions vivre. Et c'est là que les solutions dont nous allons faire la démonstration ces deux jours au salon sont tellement importantes parce que ça permet de réaliser à quoi pourrait ressembler ce monde, pourquoi nous aurions intérêt à ce mix énergétique décarboné et pourquoi c'est un projet qui peut nous rassembler, pourquoi ça peut constituer un formidable projet industriel, pourquoi ça peut constituer un formidable modèle économique pour le continent européen et au-delà, et pourquoi ça peut constituer aussi un formidable contrat social pour nos sociétés. Je crois que l'enjeu de la réussite de la transition aujourd'hui, ça consiste à passer de la contrainte qui nous divise, parce qu'on a toujours l'impression qu'elle est inégalement répartie et qui nous conduit à en faire le moins possible, de passer de la contrainte au projet, parce que c'est le projet qui va nous rassembler et qui va nous conduire à en faire le plus possible, parce que c'est quelque chose auquel nous allons aspirer. Pour qu'on passe de la contrainte au projet, il est essentiel qu'on fasse la démonstration que les solutions existent, qu'elles sont à notre portée et qu'elles ne demandent qu'à être déployées. Et l'enjeu aujourd'hui, c'est celui du déploiement à plus grande échelle. À l'échelle européenne, bien entendu, mais aussi à l'échelle mondiale. C'est une évidence de le dire, mais ça ne coûte rien de le rappeler. Le climat se fiche que nos émissions de gaz à effet de serre viennent de Lyon, de Washington ou de Bangkok. Ça veut dire que la transition énergétique, nous devons l'effectuer évidemment avant tout pour nous-mêmes, mais nous devons aussi faire en sorte qu'elle arrive dans les pays du Sud. Et nous n'avons évidemment aucun droit, aucune légitimité à exiger des pays du Sud qu'ils renoncent à leurs énergies fossiles. Mais par contre, je crois qu'il est de notre responsabilité de travailler avec eux pour que la transition énergétique ne soit pas cantonnée aux pays industrialisés. Or, quand on regarde le niveau d'investissement en 2023 dans les énergies décarbonées, il est très haut, autour de 1 700 milliards de dollars. C'est une somme qui dépasse de loin le niveau d'investissement dans les énergies fossiles et c'est très bien qu'il en soit ainsi. Mais l'essentiel de ces investissements aujourd'hui sont, sont cantonnés dans les pays industrialisés. Il faut absolument mobiliser ces investissements également en dehors des frontières de l'Europe et des pays industrialisés pour que la transition énergétique se passe partout parce que c'est évidemment un enjeu mondial et que nous ne réussirons la transition énergétique chez nous que si elle se passe également ailleurs. Et ça, je crois que c'est un enjeu fondamental et c'est pour ça vraiment que nous devons absolument aujourd'hui accélérer et mettre le turbo sur les solutions parce que très clairement, le niveau de température, hausse de température que nous connaîtrons au cours du siècle, c'est-à-dire au cours de nos existences, va dépendre des choix que nous allons poser maintenant et dans les dix prochaines années. Tout ce que nous allons faire maintenant, chaque décision que nous allons prendre, chaque investissement que nous allons faire va avoir une énorme importance pour le futur climatique que nous connaîtrons. Et c'est pour ça qu'il faut absolument, et, 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 et vraiment j'insiste sur ce point, que nous mettions en œuvre les solutions le plus vite possible. Et le meilleur moyen de mettre en œuvre ces solutions, c'est aussi de les faire connaître, de les diffuser. Et vraiment, je vous le dis, ne sous-estimez jamais l'impact que peut avoir chacune de vos innovations, chacune de vos décisions, chacune de vos actions, l'impact de ces actions est souvent beaucoup plus grand que vous ne puissiez l'imaginer. Simplement, pour maximiser cet impact, il faut le faire connaître et c'est pour ça qu'il est très important d'être dans des salons comme celui-ci. Voilà. Je n'y pas plus. Merci beaucoup. Merci euh, François Gemen pour euh, ce discours très engagé qui euh, nous donne euh, déjà un fond euh, parfait pour cette conférence. Et maintenant, un mot de bienvenue euh, de la ville euh, 
euh, août de, de la conférence, j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Emeline Baum, euh, qui est vice-présidente de la métropole de Lyon et entre autres euh, en charge des dossiers économiques. Euh, merci beaucoup. Bonjour à chacune et chacun. Merci de me donner cette opportunité de, par mes mots euh, très humbles, euh, vous souhaiter la bienvenue sur le territoire si vous n'êtes pas du territoire. Euh, vous souhaitez, comme l'a indiqué François Gémen, de vivre ce temps comme un temps de découverte et de partage de solutions. Parce que donc, dans la continuité de son, récit, de son propos, euh, je pense qu'on a toutes et tous en tête qu'il y a euh, du travail, des innovations euh, techniques et organisationnelles à porter. Mais il y a aussi, nous avons en commun un travail de récit pour parler aux habitantes et habitants, puisque moi, ma légitimité, elle est depuis un territoire, donc j'ai une responsabilité à accompagner un territoire dans sa transformation. C'est le choix que nous avons fait collectivement ici depuis juillet 2020, de dire que ce n'est pas une politique publique ou des juxtapositions de politique publique qui vont changer la donne, c'est bien un message positif d'accélération et d'entraînement de l'ensemble des acteurs, donc des organisations, de la société civile, mais aussi des entreprises et de tous les gabarits d'entreprises. Ici, vous êtes sur un territoire où il y a énormément de TPE, PME, PMI et la réalité socio-économique de la métropole de Lyon. Et sa chance, c'est vraiment d'avoir un tissu extrêmement divers qui est adossé à des petites et moyennes organisations. Et ces petites et moyennes organisations ont à leur tête des dirigeantes et des dirigeants qui ont des degrés divers de maturité sur le sujet qui vous occupe ici, la question euh, du mix énergétique, de la transition énergétique. Il y en a qui ont suivi des parcours de la Convention des entreprises pour le climat. Il y en a qui ont travaillé avec des dispositifs publics type Lyon Eco Énergie pour travailler leur sujet d'efficacité et de sobriété énergétique, que ce soit dans leur process productif ou tout simplement dans leur bâtiment. Il y en a qui ont fait le choix, euh, souvent de gros industriels, de travailler avec nous sur la décarbonation de la vallée de la chimie. Et comme l'a dit François Gémen, nous, en fait, euh, nous, depuis le territoire, on met de l'argent public, mais qui va chercher de l'engagement privé pour vraiment transformer. Mon message, la positif, c'est de dire, bien sûr que les politiques publiques, elles doivent être au rendez-vous, et ici, elles sont au rendez-vous pour la décarbonation. Mais si ça ne rencontre pas l'envie d'agir privé, ce n'est pas transformateur. Et donc, ça n'envoie pas un récit positif et en termes d'abaissement euh, des, des émissions de gaz à effet de serre et aussi d'augmentation de l'acceptabilité de cette transition énergétique. Il faut que les hommes et les femmes, les jeunes, les personnes en situation de reconversion professionnelle, les seniors, les migrants qui sont présents sur notre territoire, les hommes et les femmes qui sont en parcours d'insertion s'y retrouvent. Donc, il y a tout un volet euh, emploi et capacité de faire et envie de faire qu'il faut travailler. Donc je vous souhaite un excellent salon pour découvrir plus et mieux les solutions que chacune et chacun vous portez, entre autres avec un opérateur, enfin en tout cas un agrégateur qui est Enerdis, je le cite parce qu'on les accompagne, mais aussi ayez chacune et chacun en tête votre responsabilité à tenir et entretenir ensemble ce récit autour de la question euh, du travail des emplois, de la capacité à transformer nos territoires en France et en Europe. Et j'espère dans le monde, mais là, je n'ai pas la capacité d'influence. Bon salon à chacune et chacun. Et bien sûr, le territoire est à votre disposition si vous en avez besoin. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Emeline Baum, pour, pour votre mot de bienvenue. I will switch to English, uh, so also from my side, good morning and a warm welcome to our session. Uh, we will talk about uh, decarbonization and reindustrialization um, and European projects at work. And I just thought during the, um, the, the keynote that we meet today at the Cité Internationale uh, in Lyon, um, which is a great place, and we have a superb backdrop here with many flags, but in fact, we're only looking at European flags. Um, there's not the flag of the country of Bidenomics, nor that of the country that provides 80% of our PV modules, nor the flag of Burkina Faso or the Maldives that will be confronted with the consequences of climate change much earlier than we will. So I think one thing we should keep in mind during that discussion 
in which you will be welcome to uh, to participate also a little bit later on is that Europe should be the minimum size of uh, reflection in that context and we really have to widen our uh, scope and uh, to take into account influences that lie beyond the borders of Europe. Last year we met here to talk about decarbonization of energy. That was great, about Fit for 55. This year we will be talking about the interactions between industry and energy, which is a very hot topic and I'm sure you all have followed that in the press over the past months. Things have indeed evolved uh, since the last year. We still live under the Im impression of uh, four difficult years um, for the energy sector. Uh, we also see that the Net Zero Industry Act is now taking shape. A European electricity market reform has been validated and it will take into account the event of the years we have been through in order to create a solid playing field for actors with different technologies uh, from the pri private sector. Um, and uh, the time has clearly come to take action. Um, after discussion uh, that has gone on for many years now, um, we, if we look at the pi uh, Paris uh, pli um, climate um, target, um, 2050 is really just a few footsteps ahead of us. Um, this weekend's temperatures were clearly a reminder that we need to act quickly. We just heard it also uh, from, fr uh, from uh, François uh, Jeben. And uh, in order to decarbonize not only the power generation as we know it today, which only represents 20% of the energy we use, but the whole uh, uh, of our energy we also have to think about how to scale up uh, electricity generation in order to decarbonize mobility and heating and also different things in the industry. We will need loads of electricity. Uh, for France, we have heard last year um, the, the really massive uh, figure of 150 watt, uh, terawatt hours additionally for France alone by 2035, according to RTE. And meanwhile, we are also aware that Europe's ambition grows bigger and goes beyond now uh, de um, of carbon decarbonization itself uh, with plans for bringing back the value chain of certain technologies to Europe, critical technologies, and some of them also um, uh, consider, of course, um, uh, the energy. Um, we have been talking a lot about um, uh, PV modules. We also heard about problems in the value chain of uh, wind energy. So there are many th interesting things happening and we are really looking forward to uh, listening to our experts who will develop these points in just a second. We see also that um, the in, in the context of uh, the Net Zero Industry Act, uh, interesting things are happening on raw materials where Europe wants to work together more closely, uh, which is essential, of course. Uh, if we want to produce, we also need raw materials. So uh, many interesting things to talk about. Um, and we want also uh, to include in our reflections that, of course, Reindustrializing Europe um, to produce our own um, components for el electricity generation is great, but electricity is of course not a target in itself. It serves a purpose. Uh, our industry as a whole, our economies and also our societies need access to affordable electricity to maintain um, the current status. And this is something that I would like to develop also with our panelists. So um, we see that many things are happening and I'm really looking forward to uh, this discussion for which I um, 
would like to welcome uh, Valerie Vandenberg from the Commissariat à l'énergie atomique, where she is in charge of uh, international relations. Please be welcome on our panel. Um, Annie Scanlan from Resource, um, where she is policy and impact director. We also have Julia Constian from the European Biogas Association, where she is the secretary general and Gaëtan Masson from Becquerel Institute, um, where he is the founder and the CEO. So please welcome our panelists. <laughs> right, so um, as a start, maybe um, we, we could have a, a first analysis um, Maybe Julia would like to, to start. Um, what you maybe you can introduce yourself, what you're doing, what the role of biogas is today, and then uh, maybe a first reaction to what we just heard in the keynote. Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thanks uh, a lot for the invitation and for the possibility to address this uh, conference. Um, as I said, uh, I'm the Secretary General of the European Biogas Association. Uh, it's an association that uh, was founded 15 years ago. Uh, at the moment, we account for uh, more than 300 members and uh, 50 national associations in 36 uh, countries, so Europe and a little bit beyond. We represent, as I said, the full value chain, uh, so I'm talking about biogas producers, equipment suppliers, uh, so people really working in the manufacturing industry, traders, uh, but also um, um, distributor system operators, uh, uh, transmission system operators, so the grid basically, and um, corporate users, uh, so people that are interested in uh, um, decarbonizing their own processes and their own value chain utilizing uh, biogas and biomethane. So what is the place of, uh, of this sector at the moment in Europe? Um, we produce uh, roughly 18.4 billion cubic meters of uh, biogases, of which uh, 3.5 are of uh, biomethane, which is uh, a perfect substitute of, uh, of natural gas and can be injected into the grid or utilized in a um, heating system, uh, transport, and uh, industry alike. Uh, a quick reaction from what we heard uh, before. I think that it's important to start from the energy trilemma. So the idea of putting together security, sustainability, and equity. And what I would like to underline is that there are two points that are really important today. The first one is, uh, what does it mean to reprioritize energy security, keeping focus on sustainability? And the second one for us is, uh, how can we factor in resilience in the equation and therefore making sure that the resources of the regions, of the territories and the communities are optimizing, are optimized, leaving no one behind. So what does it mean for us, for the sector I represent today? Uh, energy crisis was absolutely a wake up call. Uh, not differently from what happened in the 70s uh, on, on the oil crisis, basically. And this was a wake-up call for the citizens, for the industries, and uh, for renewable energies as well. Um, and when we think about uh, the trilemma, biomethane in particular ticks uh, a bit all the boxes. So we're talking about a renewable gas, the most cost competitive at this point, readily available, but also infrastructure compatible. And the emergency response at European level, uh, the famous Repower U, featured an indicative target for biomethane, 35 billion cubic meters a year produced by 2030. So in six years time. Um, to give you an idea of, uh, of what this means, is a tenfold increase uh, than what we do today. And uh, to, to stay optimistic, if you ask, uh, is this possible? I still say yes, we can do it. But in order to do that, we need a very good planning. And a good planning that needs to come bottom up, but also in a centralized way. So led by the European Union and with a strong response at member state level. And we see that there are good moves in this direction. And the second point on the resilience uh, that I was making before is really regarding the sector that I represent. So when we're talking about biogas and biomethane, sometimes we think about the energy career, so the final uh, basically product that we can contribute with in the market. But 
this is wrong uh, because uh, ours is not a linear value chain. We're talking about um, a product that can really unlock a circular way uh, to understand our economy. So the first step to produce biogas is really taking streams, waste streams and residue streams that represent a challenge for society in terms of emissions and pollution and volumes. And when treated in anaerobic digestions, we can slash the emissions, reduce the volumes, and also uh, have a production of, uh, of renewables. But that's not all, because in the meantime, we also produce um, a fertilizer, digestate, which is what comes out of the value chain, that can really help the agricultural transition and the substitution of fertilizers. And when we upgrade to biomethane, biogenic CO2, that will be fundamental for uh, creating also negative emissions and those negative emissions that we need in order to get to zero carbon by 2050. Um, I will stop here um, and uh, also give the possibility to... Uh Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this um, first impression of um, <coughs> the biogas um, side of uh, the energy transition. Uh, we uh, also have uh, Valérie van den Berg on our panel from the CEA, so maybe uh, just like uh, Julia, you can give us um, a brief introduction to yourself and uh, also um, what you're working on and how that fits into the context of this um, roundtable. Thank you. So I'm Valérie van den Berg. I'm working for the CEA in the energy division. Um, the CEA is a research and technological organization, so our purpose is to um, promote uh, new technologies, new systems, uh, doing some R&D, transfer it to the industry in all the fields of uh, the energy. Um, and that means that we try to focus not on one energy vector, we're not working only on gas, even though we are working on gas, but on all the three uh, major energy vectors that are electricity, gas, and also heat. And that also means that we try to promote uh, all kinds of um, uh, low carbon energy production, production um, with a neutrality on the technology, which means that we're working on nuclear energy, but also on renewable energy, and on the way to have both of them working together, what we call the convergence between nuclear and renew renewables and air bright systems. The idea behind that is that the, the, the clock is ticking. We are in a hurry. We heard that in the introduction. So it means that we need to use all the tools that are available to us right now to move into a sustainable and low carbon energy system. Um, of course, we also try to think ahead to new tools, new innovative components that will help us in that way, but we are working also with what we have today. Um, a short point I want to make on the industry and the switch of industry into a uh, low uh, carbon mode. Um, not all uh, industrial processes will be um, electrified. It's not always possible. So that means that we will need, of course, a lot of low carbon electricity, but we will also need gas and a lot of hydrogen. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about hydrogen if you're interested. But we will need also heat because Industrial processes require heat. So we have to work on the three subjects. Electricity, low carbon electricity production in huge quantities in a sustainable way, um, heat processes and gas. And in gas, I was thinking about hydrogen, but it can also be bio biofuel or e-fuel. By e-fuel, we, we think of the processes that we won't be, um, that won't be uh, possible to address with electricity. Maybe we will still need some um, very uh, high carbon containing fuel for aviation, for instance. Maybe we will not be able to do sustainable um, uh, aviation with only hydrogen or electricity and batteries. So that means we have to take into account the um, an economy of the carbon. Circular carbon economy is also something we are working a lot on. And um, the final point I want to make is on the resources. Um, 
in one of the technologies we develop right now, we need some critical materials that are available in only small amounts, rare earth, for instance. And what is very important is to think of them in a circular way, which means that when you're doing the life cycle analysis of a component, you have to think of how you produce it, how it's economically sensible, but how you will also be able to recycle it. And we'll look into how to use um, the, the best possible use of these rare critical materials. And also we try to um, talk to industry, talk to partners to make them realize that it might be sensible in an economic way to buy a little bit more expensive components, but that are recyclable, which is not always easy to go by. And I guess that will be on for long. Thank you very much, Valerie. So um, we see that it's a really big uh, spectre of different options we are looking at today. Uh, we come now to a technology that has been touted by many as maybe the, um, the one that has um, evolved the most over the past 10 years in terms of cost and also in terms of technical progress. And Gaëtan from um, the Becquerel Institute, welcome to our panel. and. Please introduce yourself. Thanks, Ben. Uh, uh, I will finish introducing myself uh, by saying two things. First, I'm also the, um, the co-chairman of the European Solar Manufacturing Council, which is one of the two lobbies of the industry in Brussels, of the solar industry in Brussels, which was created to, um, I would say, support the renaissance of the PV industry in Europe, and I will come back on that. Uh, you, you might realize that I'm uh, half French, half Belgian, and no one is perfect. Um, and it's very funny because when I'm speaking English, I have a French accent in English, and when I speak French, I have a Belgian accent in French. <laughs> and it, it's also quite interesting to see that there are many people living in, uh, in Belgium in this panel, and I think you have a message to pass about Belgium after inviting François Germain to speak. Um, but I would like to I focus on something so else. I will not comment on that. <laughs> I would like to comment mo mostly on what Francois said um, about the difficulty to convince uh, people about the energy transition in general. And I think we are missing in general two important points. We need cheap energy. We need extremely cheap energy because it's the base of, of our society. We cannot afford, as we have seen in the last two years, to have the price of energy to triple or to quadruple every five years because of geo geopolitical rifts. We cannot afford that. And it means that we need the cheapest sources of energy to basically secure on the long, long term the development of our society. And the second point is that we desperately need local manufacturing. Even if the Chinese have invested billions into developing a tremendous industry in PV, in wind, in batteries, in electric vehicles, uh, in electrolyzers tomorrow, we need local jobs. And we need local jobs because the energy transition is destroying jobs in the conventional energy industry. And it will happen one way or another. And if we want to get rid of fossil fuels at some point, these jobs will disappear. And we cannot replace these jobs just with PV installers and roof. We need industrial jobs. And this was at the core of the discussion that we had uh, a few years ago when we created the European Solar Manufacturing Council, so a European lobby. I know the term is not super good, but to try to push for local manufacturing. And I will join what you were saying on the need to have sometimes higher costs not only for recycling, not only for sustainability, but also for local production. Uh, we don't want to compete with extremely low production costs that we have in some countries because we have other social standards, because we don't want to work 60 hours a week, because we want people to have holidays, because we want people to be well paid, and this has a cost. And this has a cost that finally European Commission started to understand, and I hope that we we'll be able to discuss a little bit about the Net Zero Industry Act, which paves the way finally for having a part of the European market for clean tech technologies, for solar, for wind, for batteries, for electric vehicles, for whatever we want, including biogas, um, with possibly a reserved market where we could 
have some added value at a higher price. Thank you. And so you didn't introduce yourself, basically. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I can't say a word. So Becker Institute is a consulting company specialized in PV. I'm not just the, the chairman of the European Solar Manufacturing Council, and I'm a PV expert active in uh, globally. Uh, and with a beautiful office uh, at uh, one kilometer from here in the, in the center of Lyon. Very nice. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, as our final panelist, Annie Scala, um, who works um, for... Um, I, I mixed up my notes, excuse me. <laughs> Please uh, forgive me. Um, from... Um, the resource. From resource, exactly. <laughs> I apologize. So, uh, but you already started introducing so yourself, and uh, a lot of things have been mentioned. Uh, and as you, in your work, as we will see, um, have a maybe a broader scope also than the other three. Uh, you can directly uh, comment on some things that have been said. Uh, I find the notion of cheap electricity very interesting because cheap is not just inexpensive. All right. <laughs> uh, so good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to be in lovely Leon with all of you today. Um, I work for the resource platform. Uh, we're a coalition of wind and energy developers. Uh, so companies like Engie and Iberdrola and then corporate uh, energy buyers. So buyers who directly procure renewables. Um, typically a lot of big tech companies. So we work very closely with Google and Amazon, which are the biggest uh, energy buyers in Europe, uh, but also lots of other companies like Unilever and Heineken, also big companies. Um, but part of our mission is really to grow the pool of corporate energy buyers, um, because not only is this a way for corporates to mitigate their scope to emissions, um, but PPAs, power purchase agreements, uh, green certificates are really tools where you can utilize private financing for the energy transition, so displacing the need for, for state support. Um, so it's hitting a lot of topics that we're, we're talking about today, about industrial decarbonization, competitiveness, the energy transition, um, and so very interesting topics to, to discuss today. Um, so it's been mentioned already that, you know, the last few years have really been unprecedented. Um, this wake up call that you mentioned, um, you know, I think that has really accelerated a, a transition that was already happening. Um, I mean, it's been very catastrophic in some ways, of course, uh, particularly thinking of kind of heavy industries in Europe where, you know, they were competitive on cheap Russian gas, basically. Um, the, pr the prices skyrocketed and that price of energy is really how they're competitive. So it's been disastrous. Lots of, you know, aluminium plants, steel plants closed their doors, may never reopen again. So it's really serious for, for European industry. So it then brings us to this situation where energy policy and industrial policy are very intertwined um, and really are at the heart of how Europe will, will continue being competitive in, in the coming years. Um, well, the, the good news, I mean, I was, I was speaking to you earlier that we do have a bit of a positive story to, to tell. Um, of course, with the Repower EU goals, there's huge targets for wind and solar. Um, but the good news story there is that we are building wind and solar at a record rate. Um, some data from Wind Europe came out recently that the wind industry is on track to be, um, you know, building enough each year that we will just about make it um, by, by the first uh, 2030 and then subsequent 2050 target. So that's first good piece of news. Um, and then these power purchase agreements that I mentioned, so direct procurement of renewables between a corporate off-taker and a supplier um, are also being signed at record rates. Um, so last year we had about 10.4 gigawatts in a single year, uh, bringing the total to almost 40 gigawatts in Europe um, that has been added to the grid. This is you know, benefits the society using private cash, which is great because, you know, countries across Europe are all strapped for money and uh, be able to use these companies' financing is really, really positive. Um, this is a very important route for markets. Um, and as I said, sort of complements very nicely what's happening over in, in CFDs, contracts for difference, which uh, continue to also be important to, to get the volumes that we need online. Um, a PPA, of course, doesn't come without risks. Uh, maybe this is something we can zoom into a bit later about this issue of price cannibalization, because indeed it's cheap, but it's too cheap perhaps at some points in the day uh, to really make that market value of solar um, competitive. 
Um, but there are some innovations happening in the market. So you see corporates probably no more signing a, a single standalone solar PPA, uh, but we've seen last year now PPAs being signed that combine technologies, so wind and solar, solar and storage, um, and this is really how you can counter out some of those, um, those price risks, um, and also the volume risk, of course, if a, if a renewable um, asset doesn't produce as expected. Um, at EU level, uh, PPA is also gaining quite a lot of traction. So you mentioned the electricity market design reform. Um, these long-term agreements have really been put forward as a solution for corporates to be able to mitigate um, you know, risk from volatile electricity markets. So that's really, really good news. Um, so that's an opportunity um, for member states to really take that reform forward as they implement and unlock PPAs for, for more companies. Um, being here in France today, um, maybe it's interesting for you to know that France is ranked currently six in the PPA market. Um, so there is a big opportunity to grow. Um, in France, there's about 2.3 gigawatts of PPA contracted capacity to date. Um, so really, if the government utilizes the reform, um, then we can really grow PPAs in France as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. So. To sum it up, um, we, we started with the trilemma where we said we want clean, stable and affordable energy. And then we said we want to do it quickly and we want to do it ourselves. A trilemma is already a tricky thing, but to have five criteria, well, what's, what are your views on that? Maybe Valerie would like to, to start? Okay, so we want to do it quickly, so we need to rely on the technology that are already ready to begin with, but as a research and technological organization, of course, uh, my purpose is to say that we cannot rely on them alone, so we have to go on and push the R&D, because we know that uh, at least 40% of the technologies that we will need to actually reach our targets are not here yet. So we have to, of course, rely on what is already available, but we have to push the R&D. That's the first thing. That's for quickly. <laughs> um, we, want to, to we want that to be cheap or at least affordable. Um, it's almost a philosophical question, what is affordable? Uh, affordable and sustainable. Maybe the prices of energy were new a few years back were too low. Maybe we have to think ahead in a new market with maybe an energy that has a um, bigger, biggest, bigger part of the final product price. So maybe we have to think a little bit on that. Um, and I guess that's the first thing, and I see that uh, my colleague wants to go back to uh, affordable and cheap. So Gaëtan, uh, I I, I think you want I, to I love the debate. I love the debate. Uh, I, I think there are two very interesting things in what you said. Um, I think we focus too much on what doesn't exist rather than what exists technologically. Uh, we can, with what we have today, reach extremely high level of uh, decarbonization with existing technologies at a cheap cost. At a cost which is similar to what uh, we experienced in the last years. If we just look at electricity, uh, um, an average decent price on the market is around 50 euro per megawatt hour. When you look at most 100% renewable energy scenarios, we are in between 50 and 70, depending on the countries. So which means something which is not increasing significantly the price of energy. Uh, we had prices you know, two years ago around 250, 300, sometimes 500 euro per megawatt hour due to extremely high prices. That's the, the, the first thing. And, uh, um, and I'm coming back to my point, um, including sustainability, including local content, doesn't increase significantly the cost of energy. There are other factors, and there is one we are never, almost never talking about, which is the cost of money. The cost of money influences significantly more the cost of energy than the cost of the components. And it's something which in general is not considered by policymakers. We would reduce even a little bit the cost of financing, and Italy is doing it, for instance, uh, in, um, for the energy transition with a very new fund dedicated to supporting that kind of risk. We could go to 
almost exactly the same energy prices as we have known in the last 10 years. So the energy transition is not more costly than the current, the current system. And that's the message that we have to pass. But it means taking a certain number of political decisions where to invest public money. And reducing the cost of capital might be one of these elements. And if, if you say we, we can uh, reach comparative uh, levels of, of, of price um, as we had before COVID, um, that would include uh, the LCOE or that would include uh, the, the total sum? Uh, that, that would include the total one. But I'm, I'm going to take a very simple example. All policymakers could act in France. If we look at tenders for PV in France, uh, the, la the last, the last uh, tender ended up with price around 75 to 80 euro per megawatt hour. In Germany, which is not known as a country where uh, uh, the sun is shining more than France, on the contrary, the last tenders were in between 45 and 50 euro per megawatt hour. What's the difference between France and Germany with regard to that? It's the cost of grid connection. We have tremendous high grid connection cost in France, and it's a political decision. Then it's very simple to say after that that uh, renewable energy is too expensive. But as we say, when you want to kill your dog, you accuse him of being enraged. And so there are things that we can do uh, which are relatively simple and which do not cost anything. It's uh, reducing the cost of grid connection would reduce the cost of solar PV electricity for utility scale plants in France by 30 to 40 percent easily, almost overnight. Right. Uh, there is a lot of um, stuff to, to talk about um, at the later stage, maybe. Uh, Julia, you mentioned that. Um, the, the different benefits of biogas and it's also if we talk about speed I think a technology that can work with uh, existing infrastructure which is quite different from uh, most other technologies in um, in the um, in in the electricity sector at least uh, how where where lie your we see the the different benefits also in in terms of uh, maybe flexibility flexibility for the the power sector where lie the the big challenges as it looks so obvious um, to use um, biogas as uh, as a means of um, energy um, why don't we use it more today. Okay, um, so I think that uh, this bundles in probably 10 questions in one. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I would like first to comment on a couple of things that my fellow panelists said. Uh, I absolutely agree that uh, we need, first of all, to, uh, to focus on what works while uh, also investing in research and innovation. We are at the moment uh, aggressively looking into uh, methanation and uh, hydrothermal gasification to make sure that uh, we can also um, diversify the way we produce uh, biogases. Uh, we're talking here a lot of about uh, electricity, but I think that what we need to underline is that uh, energy goes beyond electricity. And I think that one of the big elephants in the room is that uh, when we're talking about the energy system in Europe, half of it goes to heat. And so it will make sense to um, electrify part of it, uh, electrify part of the transport as it's currently happening at a very fast rate. But at the same time, it is important to offer flexibilities with uh, vectors that at the moment are flexible and are adaptable to infrastructures that are already existing. So for the biogas, for example, we're talking about cost. It's important to factor in uh, what are the possibilities in terms of flexibilization of the grid and giving also the possibility to integrate uh, even more portions of variable renewables within the grid uh, while offering um, a, a flexible uh, vector to, uh, to integrate those. And at the same time, also, making sure that the gas grid today gets greened uh, with volumes of, uh, of biogas and biomethane. So the key answer here, we need to scale up uh, and we need to do it fast because 
uh, at the moment, there are countries that have demonstrated uh, an incredible progress. One is Denmark, where we see that uh, we have already 40% of biomethane in the gas grid today. And this also demonstrates that technically this is uh, absolutely feasible. And we are also in one of the first of the class countries here because uh, we see the, the growth of biomethane last year. Um, most of the plants that entered into operation were located in France. And thanks also to a very uh, good and well-performing uh, zoning approach that permitted to put together the demand, the supply of the resources and the presence of an infrastructure. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Yes, please uh, go ahead. A reaction just to kind of complement that, because I, I think that's so right. Because I mean, I work with wind and solar suppliers, so I talk a lot about electricity, but the companies I work with um, take, you know, Heineken, it's a brewing company. They're on track to be procuring 100% wind and solar really by like next year or something. But that's only half their problem because their other half of the issue is heat. Um, so I think maybe we should work together on this because companies like this need this big, uh, you know, the energy, full energy solution. Um, and I think the answers aren't quite there yet. I mean, also look at the data centers. I mean, they're generating so much heat. How can we capture that and reuse it and have this circular energy system um, that really will benefit everyone? Thank you very much for uh, developing on that. And I think that uh, also creates a nice link um, with uh, what Valerie said that and we can go more into depth um, in, a, in a moment but maybe first uh, for you um, Annie um, Gaetan has mentioned the cost of money and I think that's a, a very important point that many turned a blind eye on over the, the past 20 years maybe we forgot that there's something like an inflation rate and um, and also interest but now we have seen over over two years that things can change rapidly in, in and also in um, in the field of energy we have seen that in renewables we also see it in nuclear currently um, now PPAs the PPAs you mentioned they they run shorter than CFDs for example they also maybe have or create more uncertainties for for project developers in t in terms of uh, refinancing their the project. Um, do you see that as a menace, maybe, or a problem currently? To if we talk about reaching um, policy goals for um, renewable energies, or is the um, the the for example for uh, renewable projects. Is the market strong enough to to compensate for um, for these uh, new uh, evolutions on the financial markets? Yes. So. We do see one of the biggest barrier for uh, companies that are not already signing PPAs um, is this credit risk. Uh, you know, proving bankability because. In essence, it, sh it should be a win-win-win situation because the supplier gets this guaranteed off-taker, um, the corporate gets a long-term energy procurement agreement at a fixed price, and then the bank also has a, a very kind of long-term product to invest in. Um, but typically, we have seen that PPAs are quite confined to very, very big companies. Um, so how we can kind of open that up more to bankable companies, but who maybe are struggling, uh, you know, to prove that that credit worthiness, um, I think is a big topic. Um, guarantee schemes, I think, can be quite helpful here. Um, so France actually is one of the first European countries that is experimenting with this. Um, we saw um, the first company getting a, a kind of state back guarantee to be able to sign a PPA um, in the last year. Um, there's a couple of these systems already in Europe. Uh, the EIB is also looking at pilot projects. Um, so I think learning from these, these early moves um, seeing how that can be then a, a way to open up the market. Um, but in, indeed, inflation and the cost of capital also reflects on the supplier side as well. Um, particularly in the wind industry, there's been big issues with, um, you know, deals with turbines not being pegged to inflation. Um, and that really causes a lot of bottlenecks in the supply chain. So in the end, that impacts the corporate buyer as well if the, 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 farm, the wind farms can't come online. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, Valerie, as a... Um as a scientist, um, more on the technical side maybe, um, you have been talking about a lot of different technologies you, you're working on at CEA. Um, what would be for you 
the conditions you require to uh, to scale up the use of a technology once it sorts or when, once it leaves the lab? Well, um, the first thing is um, I'm not sure there is one technology that is uh, better than the others when we are talking about low carbon energy production and not only electricity but also gas. Um, that's the first thing. Um, another thing I want to, to focus on that is that I'm not sure that there is one ideal energy mix. The energy mix that is the best for one country or one set of countries, because when we're thinking about European countries, we know that all networks are very strongly interconnected, or at least our electricity networks, depends on the resources of the country. When you're in Austria, you have lots of hydraulics. When you are in Spain, you have lots of sun. Uh, in France, you are somewhere in between. Uh, in the northern countries, you have a lot of wind and possible for large offshore wind plants. So you have to take into account the country, you have to take into account the countries around, and you have to take into account the history. We were, thinking, we were talking about the networks and the access to the networks and how to get connected to the networks. That's also something to be taken into account. When you, ha when you are in Poland, for instance, with a network given, um, it may be difficult to have huge electricity side production, huge nuclear power plant, for instance, if it means that you have to change all your electricity networks. My point here is that uh, for a technology to, uh, to flourish, it has to find its market. Its market is not always in your country. It's not always near you. Sometimes it is, sometimes not. Um, when we try to, to, to promote a technology that we developed from the lab, there are three different ways to do it. Um, maybe this technology is of interest for an industrial player large or small, then it's easy, you can sell it to him and he will ensure the deployment of the technology. Maybe the technology is almost mature but not completely and some people are willing to bid into it but there is still some work to do. Then maybe we can go into a joint venture with a few partners and we try to do it. And sometimes we have technologies that nobody believes in <laughs> yet, except maybe uh, CEA uh, s researchers. And sometimes we try to go into startups. So the way a technology will be developed depends a lot on the kind of technology, on the country, and on the market. It also depends on um, whether the society is ready to uh, accept this technology or not. Um, and scientists and researchers, sometimes we are a little bit techno-push, you know, we, we are convinced that our technology is a very good one, that it will be, that it will provide a service for the society, for the industry, and we try to say, but why don't you want that? It's very efficient, it's, but we cannot always, we do not always find the right way to sell it. So we have also to look into the market and find some market pool opportunities. So um, a, fertile, uh, er a fertile ground for a technology deployment depends on all these factors. And we, we try to, to do that um, in a comprehensive way with our partners. And a final thing, um, we just touch a little bit on the subject of heat. Uh, if, you, if you agree, I would like to come back a little bit on heat and on uh, industrial processes requiring heat because we know that it's possible to electrify some processes but heat is a very, very important uh, factor. And um, you talked about using the heat from the data center, that's a way to do it. Um, um, for a long time there, um, a long time ago already, we have some uh, uh, swimming pools, you know, that, uh, that are coupled with ice skating stadium, and then you use the heat that you uh, obtain from, uh, you, you use the heat you, you have from refreshing the ice to, uh, to warm up the, the water from the swimming pool. That's uh, something you can do on a very small scale. Uh, we can use the heat of data center 
we can electrify a lot of data center also, um, but we can also use a heat that is not used right now, which is a nuclear heat. Uh, and you, if you can use this heat as well as the low carbon electricity production, then maybe you can um, decarbonize more easily some industrial processes. Why do I want to focus on that? It's because we talked a lot about uh, photovoltaics, about uh, biomethane, uh, a little bit about wind, uh, not so much about nuclear. And in France, you know, we have this uh, uh, call for tenders within the France 2030 program uh, on an um, innovative nuclear power plant. And this advanced innovative nuclear power plants, if they, have, if they are to find a market, um, they have to think about heat. And lots of them do not only sell electricity or low carbon electricity, but also heat for industrial processes. And um, I would like maybe my co-panelists to, to go into the subject of heat because I think it's one of the key in the future. Thank you very much. No, Gaetan, uh, just I'm, <laughs> I'm taking charge of that. Um, but the, the question is important because obviously we can, um, we, we are all aware of the fact that uh, a lot of potential today has been left unused, maybe also because energy was too cheap, as Gaetan would have maybe put it. So it was not necessary to go an extra mile to recover um, all energy that has been set free somewhere in the atmosphere. Um, I see a huge problem uh, if we talk about renewable heat on what concerns um, very high temperature applications uh, like uh, for steel, uh, glass, um, cement, etc. Does anyone want to add something to, to the question that Valerie has risen, which is very important also in terms of, I mean, we're talking industry here. Um, what are the options that we have on the table today? Yes. Julia, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's really important to qualify the, the heat uh, because we can talk about uh, low medium temperature, uh, waste heat that can go in, uh, in districts or uh, to be used in residential or um, for the food industry where we need normally uh, low medium temperature. But then as Sven, you mentioned, we have other applications that are a bit more complicated and require, for example, a certain pressure in the steam, a certain temperature in the, uh, in the heat that uh, we are going to use. In certain cases, a carbon component uh, to be utilized. So um, I'm referring to, to the steel industry. And we know, because we have been in contact with, uh, with several steel producers, that at the moment, biomethane is uh, considered as one of the options to decarbonize part of the process and to provide the carbon com component that is needed for a certain quality of steels. We know that there is a very good example, actually, in France of, uh, of flat glass manufacturing based on a biomethane uh, purchase agreement. So this is something um, that we are learning actually from uh, the PPAs and the experiences of, uh, of the wind and solar industry. And we know that ceramics is also looking intensively into this. And, and so it's, it's quite important to, to leave the door open to s several solutions to decarbonize this kind of industries, but also to take into account what is the capital cost that this industry needs to undergo in order to change completely their production processes or substitute a fuel. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. Other views on that? Yes. And <laughs> go ahead. Yes, so I think the heavy industry are probably the companies I speak to the most, just because for them it's such a huge challenge and they just need so much help. So I think this mix of, of energy in the end will, will be their solution. Um, green hydrogen, we've not touched on, um, you know, the steel industry, these kinds of industries are desperate for the green hydrogen market to take off. Uh, last year, we actually saw the first um, electricity PPAs signed for green hydrogen production. So I think there are some market signals 
coming. Um, but I think there has been a lot of hype about hydrogen. And I think, you know, the hydrogen experts are still a bit on the fence of how quickly this can come online to really be the transformative effect that we're looking for. I was just going to say, I'm amazed that no one talks about hydrogen. It's like the first panel I, uh, I have been uh, on uh, for, the, for the past five years that no one wanted to talk about hydrogen. Um, good, we ticked that box also. Um, maybe, uh, maybe from Gaëtan and, uh, and also from Valerie, because she mentioned hydrogen earlier. Um, just your views. I mean, what is that... Um, the solution that will make everything possible, as it has been touted um, for many years now. Oof. Okay, I ought to answer in two minutes uh, without being too simplistic. And um, I think hydrogen is green hydrogen is a part of the solution in very specific niche applications. There is no clear business models for the time being for energy storage through hydrogen. There is a clear business model to replace conventional hydrogen in industrial processes. And there might be a business model for heavy transport, like ships, for instance. All the other ones are pu purely speculative and out of the market. And, and that's a little bit I'm coming back to the fundamentals. Um, we need cheap energy. so. We need a mix of uh, all possible clean, decarbonized electricity sources, which can provide electricity and heat and everything that we need at a cheap cost. That's the only thing. And I, I'm not going to criticize nuclear or whatever. I'm just coming back to fundamentals. Uh, if an energy source or energy vector cannot be competitive, it will be simply out of the market. Then we can decide in some specific countries because of uh, the heritage we have that we decide that that population will pay 50% more than the neighbors. That's a political choice. But globally, because we have a global problem to solve, the technologies that develop now are the cheapest and those that will develop in the future will be the cheapest as well. Um, just adding a small thing, um, I've been in, the in, in this industry for 15 years. There are plenty of 100 renewable energy or 100% scenarios, uh, which all include uh, biogas, which all include storage, will all include green hydrogen to a certain extent, but they all make hypotheses on cost reduction which have not been reached yet. And I'm going to tell you something, but promise me not to repeat it. Most probably in hydrogen, the people who will bring competitiveness to this industry are the Chinese. But shh, it's a secret. Okay, but we will <laughs> come to, to the Chinese in a moment. Uh, okay, so so much for, uh, for hydrogen, but um, to... Um, I mean, if we talk about power markets, and in that case, if you talk about green hydrogen or yellow hydrogen, uh, which would include nuclear power, um, will that be beneficial or, uh, or negative for, for price levels on the electricity market? You, Valerie, you took the mic, so. Uh, yeah, but I won't be able, I have no competence on the prices, so I won't go into that field. Just to mention two things about hydrogen. The first thing is um, we do not believe that it's a good thing to talk about the different color of hydrogen. What's important is that you produce your hydrogen in a low carbon way. That's the important factor, not the color of the hydrogen, the first fact. Second fact, um, it's true that there, there are some discussion about the hydrogen prices and the way you can use hydrogen and uh, whether there will be a market or not, or whether we will be able to produce as much hydrogen as the European Union says it will need in the future. But hydrogen is also is an interesting energy vector in two points. The first point is it can be a flexibility tool. If you are producing too many electricity at a time, then you can produce um, hydrogen through electrolysis. It's a way to store energy. Of course, you lose part of the energy 
uh, in the convention, but in every convention system you have that. That's one thing interesting. The second interesting thing is that if you have hydrogen and you, if you have carbon that you can obtain from direct air capture or from the hemisphere, then maybe possibly you can go and build um, using uh, low energy processes some e-fuels, possibly. It's not the case yet, but it's something we can think about in the future. And those e-fuels might be necessary at one point. So hydrogen is still an interesting vector, even though I agree it's there are huge of debates on hydrogen and or whether it will be deployed as largely I would think it will be, or whether it will be cost ex effective. Okay. Thank you very much for um for your input, um, and I would like to steer more in the direction of uh, of the markets because Gaëtan said we need cheap electricity, and in the meantime, it has been identified as a goal for the European Union now to have um, the European industry for uh, electricity components or energy components in a larger sense, uh, which can work in the beginning uh, with a um, support mechanism, as the Net Zero Industry Act contains um, several. Um, but in the longer run, how will things work if we have cheap electricity, how can uh, an industrial company today put their money with a, let's say, with an investment cycle of 40 years uh, in terms of their, um, their, um, their tools, how can they bank on photovoltaics, let's say, um, if the electricity itself will be cheap because the project developer will, of course, uh, benchmark on, on the electricity prices in terms of refinancing. Yes, no, <laughs> just very simple. So we have the income of a project will shrink if energy is or e electricity is cheap. I think we agree on that. So he has to buy cheap components, which should come f more and more from European factories, um, which have to, I mean, either they live on, on support mechanisms in the long run or... No, I I will I will try to explain in two minutes uh, what what the um, regulatory framework we are going to live um, to live with in the coming years. Do, so the European Union has just validated the so-called Net Zero Industry Act, which aims, amongst other things, at having 40% of local production for all clean tech te technologies. So it's not only for solar, wind, but so for all clean tech technologies. When you look at, I'm going to talk about PV because it's my, my subject, when you look at how to produce at a competitive price with our Chinese friends, we need three elements. We need cheap cost of capital, and this is something that we can achieve in Europe. We need economies of scale, so it means that we need to produce significantly more and having larger factories than what we have in Europe for the time being. So basically doing the same thing as the Chinese are doing. And this is something which we not achieved immediately. So we have to ramp them up. And during that time, the cost will be higher. And the last point is that we need vertical integration, something we are not used to in Europe. So which means if we have four or five different steps in the value chain, what we are used to in Europe is to have five different companies. The Chinese have integrated that vertically, and it allows to save costs and prices. Uh, I think the, the European framework will somehow allow that by allowing European countries, and France has already stepped in, in defining a part of the market which will be at a slightly higher cost reserved for local manufacturing. And I really think that's what we need. And the um, so-called solar pact, which has been signed uh, between the government and a certain number of actors of, uh, of the PV industry and PV market in France, is going definitively in the right direction. It's complex. It's not something that will happen easily. But I'm, I'm coming back to what Francois Germain was saying in the beginning. If we cannot 
convince people that the energy transition will be beneficial for everyone and that goes through industrial job creations, then we will have huge difficulties to make it acceptable. So we need to go through that. And I think in France, for the time being, there is a real political willingness to go in that direction. And it's, in my opinion, quite positive. Thank you very much. Any comments on that before we... I Unfortunately, I just realized we are round in running out of time. Uh, so uh, any comments before we go uh, and... and um ask questions uh, from the audience? Maybe a very quick one, um, and it will be a, a bit of a different one because uh, the, the industry that I represent is also a, a bit of a, a special technology, I would say. You know, uh, We're talking about anaerobic digestion, many different equipments that are all built in together in a big building uh, to, to make uh, different kind of biogases and then an upgrading process. So the Net Zero Industry Act, for example, recognizes uh, us as a, a clean tech, uh, technology, which is really good. The good news is that we can benefit from uh, green public procurements, for example. But when we look at the criteria of resilience, that was tailor-made for other kind of technologies, because at the moment we are already the global lead uh, in production of equipment manufacturing. And what we need to do is actually watch our back, because if the market is scaling up tenfold in the next seven years, we will become suddenly very interesting uh, for, uh, for third countries that will want to uh, import or to start also their operation. So this is a bit of a, an alarm bell that we need to, mm. to look at. Yeah, as well, you said, the technology you can develop might be more interesting for another com country than uh, than your own, that um, that goes in both ways, of course. So maybe, do we have uh, one or two questions from the audience? Yes, over there. No, um, do we have a microphone? Or? So maybe you want to uh, to present yourself and... Uh, so, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Eric. Uh, I'm a young entrepreneur. And I'm actually trying to, to, develop, to develop my own uh, localization agency. So that would basically be helping, com sorry, helping companies to adapt their marketing strategy to France. So according to what you said, do you help, in what ways do you help companies establish themselves in France? Well, <coughs> We, we, we can discuss after if you want, but the first thing is to understand the complexity of the French system. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know yes. if, if we five here are the, the, the right people to ask, um, but uh, maybe um, we, can, we can tell you whom to, to get in touch with. Okay, yeah. Other questions? Maybe more on a more macro level? No? Okay. One final question. Um, and Valerie has uh, almost um, answered it for her part, but she, she can um, come back to that. Uh, of course, we're mm -hmm. meeting today at, an in, uh, at a convention that goes by the name of Mix E, I think for energy. What would be your ideal energy mix? Maybe starting with Valerie, and then we take it from there. Well, as I said, I think the best energy mix depends on the country, depends on the resources, but it will be an energy mix that takes into account the whole complexity, the three vectors, energy vectors, electricity, heat, and gas, and uh, also um, the conversions between energy system, the storage capacity, and the network and society appropriation and all that we didn't talk about, which is the demand side management. How can you um, help people to take into account what is needed by the grid or by the energy system to, um, to have some flexibility coming from the demand side? So um, that is what we think would be an ideal energy mix. And uh, I do invite you to come to the CEA booth because we have tried to put that 
in a, um, in a mock-up with a Lego mock-up. So if you want to discuss more about our vision of uh, the possible ideal energy mix, please welcome and see us in our booth. Thank you very much, Valerie. And that's, thank you for, for raising the question of the mindset management because that, of course, is also an industrial uh, topic and industry could become really a major vector of flexibility and a prosumer in that sense. So maybe, Annie, you would like to... Yep, um, I'll keep it short because I think we're losing the room. Um, but <laughs> I, two, what, two, one thing we didn't speak about is grids. Um, this is a huge bottleneck for the electricity transformation. So a call to action for all of us in this room. Whenever you speak to policymakers, you need to keep banging this drum because none of this is going to happen without a really significant grid build out. And then on the market side of things, um, another thing we didn't really go into is the price cannibalization of solar. Yeah. Um, but there are options out there with corporates really procuring this mix of energies to be able to balance that and also helps alleviate some of the grid issues that we're seeing. So um, yeah, policy and markets do have the solution. Thank you for raising these points. And of course, um, a price on the market reflects also a physical reality. So um, a low price uh, also indicates that there's too much of offer uh, on on the grid um, and we have to cope with that uh, also in terms of business models. Julia. Um, I would say an energy mix that um, factors in as, uh, as much renewables as possible um, and uh, that takes into account circularity but also um, impact on, uh, on communities and uh, on local regions. Great, thank you very much and Gaëtan. In two minutes. <laughs> I as agree as with as everything that was said. Great, yeah. wonderful. Very, um, uh, very conclusive. Uh, I thank you for very much for sharing your views. Uh, it was a real pleasure for me to, uh, to be the moderator of this panel. Thank you very much for being with us. A big round of applause to you. And uh, I wish you a good day uh, and uh, many great uh, meetings here on the convention. Thank you very much. See you soon.